Hello, and welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Josh, and we're so glad you're joining us today. Before we get started, I want to highlight just a few things. On our website, you can find a digital connection card that you can fill out. Let us know you're worshiping with us today. And if you have any prayer requests, we'd love for you to fill that out. There's also resources for adults and children um, that you can find to assist in worship. And with that, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the sound of singing, with trumpets and the blast of the ram's horn. Shout for joy before the Lord, the King. Let us worship God. Our God is a God of love, our God is a God of peace, and our God is a God of forgiveness. And so it is with confidence that we can come before God and confess our sins because we know that He is quick to forgive. And so if you would join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against You in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. And now hear us as we continue to confess in the silence of our hearts. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. It comes from 2 Corinthians and it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that not only are we forgiven, but the old is gone and the new has come. We have been remade in Jesus Christ. And so be at peace. And now, let us continue in our worship.
As we enter our new year of God's mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. Gracious God, all throughout 2021, bless your church. Renew the strength of pastors, elders, deacons, musicians, and all servants of the church. Assist congregations in paying their bills. Give hope in your goodness and joy in your salvation. Bountiful God, bless your earth this new year. Hold the ecosystems of the earth in balance that you intend, from coastlands to farmlands, forests to wetlands, deserts to rainforests. Reveal new ways for us to live in harmony with your creation. And sovereign God, bless the nations of the world. Bring peace and justice where there is violence and abuse of power. Inspire those in authority to serve the common good and preserve stability in the United States. Protect those who risk danger for the sake of others. Reconciling God all throughout 2021, leave us, lead us out of patterns of prejudice and into reconciliation with one another. Help us to honor all persons as members of your family and as siblings under your care. Loving God, give us wisdom in our resolutions and strength during hardships. Console those who are afraid or lonely. Give jobs to the unemployed and direct us toward the solution to the world's problems, to feed the hungry, to house the homeless, and to serve the neighbor. Compassionate God, attend to all those who suffer this year. End this pandemic. End all those, help all those working to distribute the vaccine safely and efficiently. Strengthen healthcare workers and accompany those living with chronic and invisible illness. And we be especially with the families of all those who have died this past year. Hold them as you hold us in your mercy and visit all those to whom we name before you now in the silence of our hearts. Amen. And now, in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from the love of God, we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship. If you would join me in prayer. Uh, gracious God, we ask that you would speak to us today, that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would invite us into a new way of living. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us today. Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts, souls, and lives to be changed. We pray these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, this past year, Chaley and I have been working through a parenting book that, that talks about helping kids mature from childhood through adolescence toward maturity. And in the book, there's a helpful analogy about what this looks like. The author likens this process of maturity to learning to feel comfortable in a swimming pool. The parents are the side of the pool or maybe the shallow end. Maturity is being out in the waters, in the deep end, where there's fun and where there's danger. Anyway, the process of maturity happens as the children learn to swim away from the parents and into the deep end. But as often happens, there's a mistake that's made. They get a little bit too far. They get a little bit scared. And then they return back to the parent for a little bit before they're ready to swim back out again. 
which explains some of the I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, I love you of uh, whipsaw action of the teenage years. Now, all of that's interesting enough, but there's one more part of this analogy that actually is even more intriguing and, for our purposes today, more relevant. And that is that there are different lanes of maturity, different strands, areas, measures of maturity. And true maturity is found as we are able to swim in the deep end in each of these different areas. So one of these areas is being able to harness your emotions. Another is to plan for the future. Another is self-care. Another is leaving childhood behind. But here's what's interesting and relevant about all this. Often a child will start to mature in one of these areas, but not necessarily in another one. And so you may have a child who is very, very good, very, very mature in self-care, but a seemingly toddler with their emotions. Or there's one who is absolutely ready to leave childhood behind, but not actually able to plan for the future just yet. You can be mature in one area and not mature in another. This analogy becomes helpful in that it reminds us that maturity maybe is not quite so binary. It, it's not that you are immature or you are mature. You, have, you are not there yet or you have arrived and there's nothing in between. This reminds us that there are different ways, different areas in which we need to become more mature. But now let's make a turn. Because here's my question for us today. Is that also true of Christian maturity? What does Christian maturity look like? Or, or maybe even more interestingly, what are the marks of Christian maturity? Normally, I think it's helpful to ask whether or not we've become more mature in our faith in this last year, and then ask the question, how will we become more mature in this next year? But the twist that I find myself thinking about this year is what are the different areas that I should be maturing in in my faith? How am I doing in each one of these different areas? And how might I grow better in each one of them in this next year? I mean, are there marks, are, are there measures that signify Christian maturity? And if so, what are they? And then how can I do a better job this year of working on each one of those areas? That's what I want us to spend a little bit of time working on and thinking about today. And this is also where we're heading over the next couple of weeks. We're going to identify some of these different areas and then talk about what they look like and more importantly, how do we grow in each one of them. But before we dig into all of that and our passage, I want us to take just a moment to kind of zoom all the way up, take a much, much higher view about where we've been and where we're heading this year. In 2016, we spent a lot of time with Jesus. We walked all the way through the Gospel of Luke all year long. 2017, we spent a lot of time with the Holy Spirit, spiritual gifts, characteristics of the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? Who is the Holy Spirit? 2018, we got a little bit more practical looking at life and death and the Christian idea of work. 2019, we really zoomed in on God the Father, uh, and we spent a lot of time talking about love as well. In this last year, 2020, we spent a lot of time talking about living out our faith and being committed to community together. We looked at Elijah a little bit, Psalm 23, Colossians, spent a lot of time with the early church, the book of Acts, before ending our year talking about the kingdom of God and becoming a kingdom people. So where do we go from here? I'm glad you asked. In 2021, we're going to explore the image of law and grace, of discipline and freedom. We'll begin by talking about maturity, then talk a little bit about character. We'll spend the summer talking about the Ten Commandments in maybe a way you're not used to. 
And then in the fall, we're going to look at Christian discernment. How do we as Christians discern what is right and what is not? If I were to try and sum up the whole year right now, maybe we're looking at the question, would we experience more grace and freedom in our Christian lives if we pursued Jesus more, lived a more disciplined, committed, intentional faith and life? That's where we're going. But we start that longer journey today as we begin our search for the marks of Christian maturity. So if you would, I would invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in Him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness." Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Amen. As Paul writes, you can hear his excitement and urgency as he encourages these Christians towards maturity. 
Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Put off the old, put on the new. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us. Over and over again, Paul points towards and urges Christian maturity. Now, since we're starting in chapter 4, it is important that we review a little bit of the context of what came before in order for us to understand fully what Paul is talking about now. Because all throughout the first three chapters, Paul has been reminding these early Christians about the good news of our faith. And this part happened first for a reason. Uh, to kind of sum it up, I'm going to read a, a long section from chapter 2 just so you can get a sense of where Paul has been before he got to chapter 4, which we just read. There's a portion of chapter 2 that says this, Because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. In other words, all of the saving has already happened through the work of Jesus. We have been saved by grace when we were dead in our transgressions. All of that is done. He's already talked about all of that. And so what we're looking at today in this series throughout this year and really in our passage today is then how do we respond to this good news? Given that Jesus has died for us, given that we are saved, now what? And part of the answer is grow in maturity. So I want us to dig deeper into this idea. What is Christian maturity? What are the steps of maturity before finally and briefly talking about why. Why should we become mature? So what is maturity? What are some of the steps of maturity? And then finally, why? And we'll start simply enough by talking about maturity. All throughout our passage, Paul is encouraging and exalting this idea of Christian maturity. We should be mature in every respect, he writes. We should be growing. We should become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Over and over again, Paul is pointing toward this idea of maturity. Which, of course, begs the question, are we growing in our Christian maturity? And how would we know? I mean, we're all older Christians than we were last year. We've all put a little bit more mileage on our lives over this past year. But have we also become more mature in this past year? And be careful, because it's easy to try and write off all of 2020 as a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad year. And that's accurate enough. But I don't think it's an excuse for not also having grown. In fact, if you were to look back at 2020 as kind of a midterm exam to assess your faith, I think most of us, a lot of us, would be hoping for a pretty big curve on that exam. Because I think most of us turned a little bit farther away from our faith when we went through some hard times. But of course, it's hard to even make this assessment. Because Maybe we grew in one area of our faith and not in another. Remember, part of the idea of maturity that we're looking at is maybe there are different areas of maturity. An infant, for example, could become better at motor control, but become a little bit less mature in social interaction. So are they maturing or do we have to average these out a little bit? Maybe more to the point, if I looked and relied upon God a little bit more in 2020, but I prayed less, studied less, worshipped less, 
Did I become mature or not? Do you see the issue here? Over the next six weeks, I want us to really dive in and try and figure out what are these six marks of Christian maturity. Uh, And then how are we doing in each of them? And hopefully, what can we do in this new year to grow in each of these six? Kind of like a, a New Year's resolution. How do we get in shape this new year in each of these areas? And so, over the next six weeks, I want us to specifically explore this idea of having knees for prayer, having a mind for Christ, having mouths for sharing, having feet for going, having hands for serving, and having hearts for God. Again, we'll dig into this a lot more over the next six weeks. But again, knees for prayer, minds for Christ, mouths for sharing, feet for going, hands for serving, and hearts for God. And what I find particularly interesting is that you may be decently mature in one of those areas and yet not in others. You could have a a PhD in Bible knowledge, have a very mature mind for Christ, and be very immature in prayer. You could be a missionary, which is clear maturity for feet for going and hands for serving, and yet you may not have any passion for studying your faith at all. You could be a Presbyterian and therefore not be very mature at all in having a mouth for sharing. But with all of that, there's also great hope because each of these individual marks can be worked on, can be trained, can be developed. And so that's what we're going to do. But there's something else in our passage that may help us along the way and be worth thinking about before we're done today. At the beginning of our passage, Paul talks all about maturity, but then at the end, he adds a helpful level of detail, which also may help us as we think about this new year and our own maturity. You see, Paul tells us to not live like the Gentiles, but to also leave behind infancy in order to become more mature. And the way I see this, I'm thinking that there are two different moves toward maturity. The first is away from living like the Gentiles live, almost a move away from that toward infancy, and then the second move is from infancy to maturity. There are things we need to leave behind, but then there's a whole other set of things we need to press on towards in order to become mature. And again, this isn't about becoming Christian or being saved or heaven. That's already happened. That was earlier in the letter. This is after that. This is how we respond to that. But you'll notice that response seems to come in two different steps. So let's look into this a little bit. Paul tells us we are to take off our old selves, our Gentile way of life, and this helps us to become infants, but then we are to put on our new selves which lead us away from infancy toward maturity. But again, notice two parts, two steps. Take off the old, put on something totally new. Paul gives us some examples of what this looks like. In verse 28, Paul writes, Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Notice two steps. First, stop stealing. That's the first step. But that doesn't make you mature. That just means you're not a thief any longer. There's another step toward maturity. That is find work and share. In other words, it's not enough to simply stop stealing. That just gets us to infancy. You also have to find work. You have to work hard. You have to make an income so that you can then share, so that you can then become generous. And that is a little bit more of the picture of maturity. It's not just stopping the bad behavior, but it's also starting the good behavior and maybe even the opposite behavior. It's a twofold change of who we were into who we are to become. 
Paul gives us, gives us another example in verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Again, notice two steps. Stop the unwholesome talk, but then start using your words to build others up, to benefit others. Two parts. Stop doing one thing, but then transform that action into its opposite. Don't be a gossip anymore. Don't be a slanderer anymore. Instead, be a helper and an encourager with your words. What a transformation. Even at the end of the passage, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, all of that. But then be kind, compassionate, forgiving, and follow God's example, walking in the way of love. Again, take off this whole list of old things and put on a whole list of new things. Be changed. It's also worth noting that it's not enough to just stop doing the bad things or even to just generally be good. But what we're working toward here is actively changing our ways, actively repairing the damage that was done when we lived like Gentiles. We are to be so radically transformed as we mature that we are actually making progress in the opposite direction of how we used to live. This is the challenge and life-changing nature of our faith. This is how God continues to do the work of not just renovation, but of resurrection in our lives. This is what it means to become mature in our faith. And why? Well, well a couple of reasons. First and mostly, it's simply what we're supposed to do. It is how we respond to what God has done for us. It is how we make the most of the life that God has given us. It is how we respond to the good news of our faith. But then it also just seems like a better way to live. Mature Christians seem to weather storms better. It's not that they don't have those storms, they just seem to weather them better. Mature Christians live more selfless, sacrificial lives and therefore more meaningful lives. Mature Christians don't get their feathers ruffled quite so easily and yet still feel deeply. Mature Christians do more good in the world because they don't need the credit. Mature Christians live more fulfilled and fulfilling lives. So it seems simply to be worth it. It doesn't mean that life will always be easy. In fact, it means the opposite of that. Life will be harder but it's the choice to live differently. It's how we grow up. It's how we become more mature. And it's what God invites us to live in. If you would join me in prayer. Lord, we ask that you would help us as we embark on this journey, that you would help us to become more mature, that we would leave our old ways of life and that we would put on these new ways of life, that we would be transformed and changed as we become more mature in our faith and as we become more like your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray even now that you would fill us with hope, fill us with strength, fill us with courage that we might make this journey with you, that you would help us in this new year, that you would walk with us and help us follow you better as we live a more disciplined, intentional, committed life, and as we experience more grace and freedom and peace. And so, Lord God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for this new year. And we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. At this time, let us continue in our worship.
God has showered us with grace and gifted us with good things. As a church, we respond with generosity. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the ways you continue to work in our lives and for the love you always have for us. Help us to be good stewards of these gifts, caring for others as you do for us. Form us into your holy people and make us faithful disciples of your good news. Amen. During this time of social distancing, we continue to give to the church as we're able. Uh, that can be through time. It can also be through monetary gifts as you feel moved, which can be accepted in the form of check or uh, gifts online on our website. And with that, we continue with worship. Never, ever 
if you would join me as we affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us continue in our worship. Before we're done today, a couple quick announcements. First, we have a congregational meeting at 10 a.m. on Sunday. After the 9 o'clock worship service is done, we're doing that in person or via Zoom. You can find the Zoom information on the website now or in the e-news. Uh, we'd love it if you would join us for that. The purpose of the meeting is to receive the nominations from the nominating committee about new officers and then voting on those. The meeting should only take a couple of minutes, so please be prompt. Please join us for that meeting. Uh, additionally, we are still uh, serving by collecting funds for hurricane relief for Louisiana. So if you would like to donate, please uh, drop that off in the church office or you can do it online. Uh, and then uh, finally, there's a couple of different worship opportunities that I want to call your attention to. Tonight, Sunday night at 6 p.m., we're having a Zoom uh, communion service. Uh, so you can join us for communion at 6. And then on Sundays, we have multiple ways to worship with us. You can worship online. You can worship in one of our worship gatherings at 8 o'clock outside or 1045 in our worship center. Uh, and then we're having a normal 9 o'clock service that's happening at 9 a.m. Uh, please join us for any worship service that you feel comfortable uh, worshiping in. Uh, and with that, all the rest of the announcements are in the e-news or they're on the website or they're in the bulletin. And with that, receive the benediction, which comes from our Ephesians passage for today. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. God's blessings be upon you today and forever. Amen. <laughs>